My earliest recollections of Vladimir Horowitz came as a very, very young child. My father was the associate concertmaster of the NBC Symphony with Toscanini and often served as concertmaster as well. And he would return from rehearsals uh, exhausted, but very often in a level of quiet reflection and enthusiasm. And he would attempt to explain to his three-year-old, four-year-old prodigy son what the essence was that the maestro attempted to get across to his musicians at rehearsal. And it usually focused around the, the soul of the music, the heart, the humanity, the, the depth of emotional expression that Toscanini would in some way always find virtually in every phrase, in every gesture of the music. It was this that struck me first about the playing of Horowitz, that every line was imbued with its own emotional content. Where Horowitz's greatness lied, or lay as I saw it, was not only so much in that remarkable variety of technique which allowed for the the almost unutterably light and fluid and rapid and fluttery type of um, of speed and and gentle Mendelssohnian uh, uh, nymph-like quality. To me, the greatness was in the way in which each line of music had its independence. When Horowitz played, he was like a small chamber ensemble. The bass line was given the same type of care as if he was a cellist or a singer of bass range. And the notes were connected by a similarity of color and timbre, by a tonal cohesion that if one listened only to the bass line, one would get the impression that this was a very great cellist or bassist playing. The middle voices were always not only clear, which is sort of the uh, the mechanics of what he did, but within that clarity there was content, that they were played with uh, an inner pulse of energy, with a viola or second violin type of care of detail without getting in the way unless necessary. If one were to fault anything there, it might be in hindsight to see that occasionally he emphasized notes within the line, always with a a true purpose, almost trying to illuminate what it would be that Schenker would have us notice that there were certain notes in their harmonic voice leading capacities that the musician would yearn to have emphasized since they are the notes that form the content of the harmony and therefore 
pull us or lead us to the next important note. But if one default that at all, occasionally, and maybe mostly near the end, where certain lines were brought out almost in an arbitrary fashion. The, the last recording of the Liszt Sonata comes to mind, which obviously he struggled very greatly with. But there were notes in the inner voices that could have been emphasized with less uh, an obvious quality and more of that, that early subtlety. The other voices, tenor, melody voices, were always there, not just shown or emphasized, but played with the same type of love and care and clarity as if he were an instrumentalist that played just one line. So we really are dealing with a pianist who was a small chamber ensemble somehow, and that those who have mentioned that often his chords were not played together would be advised, I feel, to recognize that these are not chords in the usual sense, that these were the simultaneous playing of many different lines, and therefore the emotional content of each line would almost necessitate that they might enter at a particular beat slightly earlier or later than their companion lines, because intrinsic in their own content would be their own particular placement. And if one listens often to some of the pianists of the, uh, let's call it older school, but I think that it lives very much today, that are more interested in the, in the contrapuntal content rather than just a, a chordal um, striking of the piano, that the need to clarify these different lines uh, makes it almost necessary that the, the chords are separated in different ways. I won't say broken, because again, that's a technical concept that does not include somehow a musical essence, that the voice is just simply landed at different times. So for me, from a young child onward, the first thing a, an immature musician might notice was the tremendous speed. And this might also have been a component of his work which in retrospect may have achieved something that he did not necessarily want to achieve. His playing was so astounding to those that heard him that they felt in many ways that this was the way in which the composer might have wanted his work performed. And let's take, for instance, the Tchaikovsky Concerto. As we know more and more about the symphonies, and we are able, because of the quality of our musicians in these orchestras, to achieve ever greater performances that are more rich and more round and more sonorous and more spread out in their golden, unhushed, unpushed, unhurried glorification of the the harmonies and the melodic content. We recognize that a great symphonist, as was Tchaikovsky, from the first note to the end note of a movement and even of the symphony had a structure in mind that was in part held together by a pulse, by an exorable, inexorable heartbeat or breathing of the music, that once the symphony started, there was an inner dance that 
yes, would move and would slow down and would uh, be able to even come to a halt or, or push almost to the limits. But that pulse was always there. It was always pulsing faster or slower. In Horowitz's recording, at least, and I make a very important distinction here, that in the recording, there are places that go so fast, even taking Tempe left by the orchestra, where he would continue the musical material in the the double octave passage in the first movement comes to mind where the orchestra ends a certain tempo and and Horowitz takes off at a, um, a good quarter, maybe a third faster than the orchestra left him. This would not happen in a symphony controlled by a musician as great as Horowitz, that in some way we start to see that from the earliest moments on that he was at the mercy of some element within himself of which he did not have total control. My sense is that he had what many, many musicians have had, which is that the faculty of rhythmic pulse, that the integrity of being able to control within a inner sense of movement and pulsing and um, heartbeat, that this would occasionally leave his ability to control it, and that the music would sometimes race headlong onward. And his musicianship and his technique was able in most cases to control this, so that we have an archive of documents on recording as if this is what he fully intended to do. But I suspect that a great deal of what was done in live performance, and to a lesser extent in studio performance, was not the conscious desire of what the artist wanted, but rather when he was at the mercy of some, one is almost tempted to call it a, a, a shadow, a, a demonic element within him, that uh, of, of which he did not have uh, full control. And what has happened is that a tradition has grown on the performances of those pieces where I hear young students practicing the Tempe of Horowitz, uh, playing with the type of volatile, uh, wild, um, the, the demonic um, care to the winds that was fine for a Horowitz where one sensed that he was on the the edge of uh, an abyss or a precipice during the performances that caused in, in many ways their, their hair-raising content. For a young student who emulates this, it should be understood that this may not have been wholly intended. An example of Rachmaninoff comes to mind, where Rachmaninoff in playing his own um, Paganini Rhapsody uh, at the beginning of what we could call the uh, the third movement of the 19th variation, uh, the orchestra starts a very wonderful, sober tempo, and Rachmaninoff enters at that tempo for three beats, and then suddenly gets faster and faster to the point within two bars he's twice as fast. Was this intended? Well, obviously not. It is amusical. It doesn't make any uh, sense in terms of the music. It was almost as if he could not control, partially because of lack of practice time. We must remember these artists played so many different works in such short periods of time that they could not have the, the time to prepare every um, passage for its complete um, muscular neurological control. And therefore a tradition has 
arisen for the Tempe to be attempted for the Rachmaninoff Paganini, which I think is totally antithetic to what the musical content is all about. However, given that these wanton, and I won't say wanton by lack of integrity or purpose, but volatile, that when something took over the man's body and spirit, and I would also hazard a guess that when he left the stage at 48, especially 48 years old, when he, when one listens to the recordings or the recorded performances that came just before, one is struck by a man really being ripped limb from limb. Uh, it is almost uh, from the serenade of Britain that the, the witties will gnaw you to the bare bane. If one listens to the B minor scherzo, it is almost painful in his attempt to hold back what his body seems to be doing and pushing him forward. And it could be that with all of the other reasons that we know about, that and it reached a point that it becomes too frustrating and too difficult and too puzzling and too uh, frightening to walk on the stage and have what one had worked for in terms of a, a warm, expressive uh, Interpretation be rendered uh, almost a uh, a testimony to the fast and the uh, the technical rather than the human and humane. What I began to learn about Horowitz as I listened more and more that I felt was where he was the greatest. And I think the, the the highest point may have been the recording of the D minor, Rachmaninoff, back in the 40s, maybe early 50s, which was the most calm and beautiful and uh, carefully laid out um, poetic touching human document that we have of this concerto. And one can see the calm heart, the heart unpossessed, as it were, uh, there being able to, to sing every note with the compassion and the humanity and the, the unspeakably caring, loving, soul that with which he was imbued and it's a very different Horowitz one can hear it in the, the Kindersen and one can hear it in many of the Scarlatti's one can hear it in much of the work and I think this is the, the Horowitz at his greatest we must remember that in terms of repertory Horowitz yes did many different things but his repertory was not large and we have had pianists who have performed where one gets the impression that a few missed notes here and there, that on another playing, that they could simply play with perfection uh, as easily as not. With Horowitz, strangely enough, although it was his technique that people spoke about, one gets the impression, and it's, it's somehow... Uh, could be argued was uh, bared out in the uh, the recordings in which he could have gone back and corrected mistakes that there were certain things he was not able to do at the keyboard and I find this very wonderful because it showed that the man was very human that he struggled with the same type of mastery of control that a circuit would suffer with and work for and strive for and then at the end result may not have achieved the perfection that he obviously 
strive for. But what was always there was the ability to sing each line of the music and to carry through because of his deep compassion and because of his gentle nature a human document which to me is so much more important than the technical pianistic document that we have an archive of recorded materials and live performances on recording that one can experience his soul and touch the the glory the caring the compassion the empathy the sympathy understanding for other human beings with which his music was uh, filled and it was this side of our wits that as I became sensitive enough in, in later years in my life to experience is what I recognized as the greatness. I do not necessarily admire someone who plays fast and, and brilliantly. It's like admiring an actor who can speak very quickly. Uh, the, my sense is, so what? Uh, what good does that do to a suffering humanity? What does good to a suffering humanity was that it was impossible to miss that that man on the stage, tortured by his own inner world, came out of it not disgruntled or frustrated or unable to communicate quite the contrary, that his own awareness of what it took for him to simply get through the day, let alone to perform the feats of miraculous uh, musical utterance with which he lived his life, he came through that with understanding and compassion for the frail human condition, the loneliness, the potential joy, but the struggle of the passion of a human heart filled with light and filled with darkness. And in that struggle, I sense, came his greatest music making. To conclude, Horowitz to me will not be remembered as the great technician or one who made the stamp on the century because of an ability to control the piano or play or the type of technical mastery at the piano. He will be remembered because he was a unique personality making it possible for other unique personalities to have the sense of dignity, the sense of striving to be totally oneself and not trying to emulate someone else because there is a tradition or there is a way or one way of performing something which we have learned is utter nonsense. If there is a style that Mozart played in, we don't know what it was. If there was a style that Beethoven played in, we can just go by those that happen to have heard him and understand their biases. And as we hear the great individualists, we wonder where are our individualists? Those that are not eccentric, making music, of playing music out of shape simply because it's different. But 
those who strove for their own personal expression because they found that the most beautiful way in their hearts to express a theme. And coming to that not by a few hours of pianistic work, but by living and breathing and sleeping and dreaming that music so that those melodies are played with the beauty that has been found through song and through dance and through the understanding of poetry and literature and the leader written by the composers and the opera written by the composers and understanding the entire oeuvre of a composer's work so that we not only can psychoanalyze the composer through letters and through the compositions themselves, but to break through that intellectual strapping to divine the true heart and soul of these composers. And to take from their unique ability of being themselves the strength to put down any sense of trying to emulate or trying to live up to a tradition that may or may not have any basis in historical reality, but to give all of us the strength for self-actualization to become who we were born to be and to remain the childlike 